We understand, uh, Father, that every day is a gift that you give to us, that your mercies are brand new every single day, and that those who are tuned in today are just um, awakening themselves to the more that you have in store for them. Father, we thank you that you are causing us to rightly divide your word of truth, that your truth is the only truth that is eternal truth. And we pray that they are not just hearers of your word, but doers of your word, that they continue to understand that may it be so that they are living epistles so that those who look upon them will see likeness and image of Christ. And so, Father, we love you and we honor you and we give you the praise. We thank you for every single ministry leader who continues to undergird and support this ministry. And we pray that all of those who are tuned in, that they begin to become ignited with the fire, that there's an urgency, an urgency inside of them to pursue more, to do more, uh, and to understand what it means to be made in the image of your only begotten son. So we love you and we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. And so I'm going to continue. I'm going to do what is called just a comprehensive recap of what we've been talking about over the last couple of weeks. And so we've talked about tools. We've used this new jargon. We've had some new vocabulary. I'm positive that some of you have been seeing how um, you can use your tools, not just when we're on the screen, but in person, in your work life, in your professional life, uh, in your personal life. Um, really, I'm, I'm, I'm positive the Holy Spirit has really been speaking to you. And I pray that you've been obedient and bending your ear to the lips of God so that he would cause you to rise up and not be in a posture of complacency. Um, sometimes that can happen to us if we continue to hear something over and over again. But I'm praying that your spirit is quickened, um, that you are remembering the story that God has about your life and that there's more to come and that you are not at the end. And it doesn't matter where you are right now. What matters is where you're going. There are two scriptures that I just want to highlight before I get into the message. I know sometimes when we come into the conservatory, because um, we are a ministry of teaching, of deep teaching, it's revelatory teaching. We have a, vin a visionary who um, really is about the scribal anointing, that there are many things that you hear here that you probably have never heard before. And that's not because we're bragging or we're being bodacious in any kind of way. It is God's truth about what he's called um, the apostle and visionary of this ministry. There are two scriptures that I want to highlight for you today. The first is as we go through this excavation process, I was drawn to John 15 and 19, and I'm going to read it for you and then talk just briefly about it a couple of seconds, and then I'll go on to the next one. So this is John 15, 19, and it reads, if you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you, right? So we hear this phrase all the time. We are in the world and not of the world. So when we go through this process, this journey of navigating, you know, God allowing, God really unearthing the, the you he created, we need to see ourselves as people who are not just physically in this temporal world that we have, but we have this kind of dual citizenship. And by that, we are citizens, of course, in our respective areas, but we're also kingdom citizens. So when we think about our identity, our identity is an identity that comes from a kingdom perspective. That is so important. So there are some things that God is going to unveil and unearth about you that the world does not like. And we need to be strong and fortified in understanding that some of the things that, that are going to come out of us, some of our doings, some of our behaviors, some of our deeds, our ways of thinking, right, are, is going to be very different than world systems, than world amores, than the, the, the cultural practices that they have. We're going to be very different. The word says we are a peculiar people. So we need to be confident in knowing that what God says about us is true and every man is a lie. So with that, I want you to truly understand when we're going through this process that there's some things because it's kind of like you're warring with yourself. Like on the one hand, you see that the world says this about what it means to be of value, right? But then God says something else because God is about spiritual and eternal eternity. So I want you to, um, as we're trekking along, to keep that in mind. The next scripture I want to read to you, and you've heard these all before, but it's so important. So this is going to be 2 Timothy, 
This is the third chapter in 16. You've heard it all before. It says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. I want to say these words again. Profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction. All of those things that the scripture is God breathed. That's a, these are not ordinary words. So when we use our tools and we're reciting scripture and we're meditating and we're really trying to understand the spirit of the scripture, we're understanding that these are Holy Spirit infused words. God breathed. The, the words themselves are the breath of God. They're the breath of God. They're just, they're not dead words. They are living words that resurrect us when we speak them. So these are the two things I want you to just remember as we're going along. I'm going to share my screen in a moment here. Is everyone there? Yes. Thank you so much. I want to make sure that we're all here uh, as I navigate my screen here. I'm going to bring it out a little bit. And um, I'm going to start at the very beginning here. Let me go back a little bit. All right. Again, I want to just say welcome to all of you. I think most of you have been tracking with us today. Again, just officially to let you know in case there are some visitors, this is the Scribal Conservatory Arts and Worship Center. And again, our founder and visionary is Apostle Teresa Harvard Johnson. I am Minister Chiquita Ture, his excavator. So this is simply a comprehensive uh, culminate, if you can say like a culmination of everything that we've been doing. Um, again, the legal disclaimer, those of you who've been tracking, you've been going through using your tools. If you feel the, the need to go to a professional, a licensed therapist, then by all means, please do so. That's very important. Um, today, we're going to kind of zoom in on this part right here. We're going to take a look at Moses, King David, and Apostle Paul. Um, you had homework, um, and Minister Darlene did an excellent recap on Tuesday. And I want to say just to thank everyone who've been coming to the recaps on Tuesdays, because that's a time and space for you to ask questions. As Apostle Teresa said, it's always important to ask those questions and not, you know, if you don't, if you don't know, just ask those questions. And we are prayerful that this is a space where you feel comfortable in asking those questions, because none of us, we're not, a, we're not a, omnipotent. None of us are the, the sovereign God and we communicate and support each other in community. So it's important. And sometimes there may be a question you think someone else um, has asked it, but they have not. So be mindful of that. I also want to point out when we talk about homework, I've been thinking about this whole idea and the mindset that we have about homework, because I always say it's for your doing. And I said, maybe we need to just say the self work. Because sometimes we think that if I go and I do this and I present it, then, you know, I've done my due diligence. Um, and I will say to you that the work that's necessary for you to do is not about an external influence. I want to say that again. It's not about an external influence. It's about you having this connection to God so much so that you you are so quickened in your spirit that you know this is necessary for you to move on to the next step. That you begin to examine yourself, that you begin to look at your thought processes and your behaviors, and you begin to partner with God, not to the extent that you're trying to impress someone else, but there's such a fire inside of you that you want to know more, that you pant, that you have this desire to really know what God would have you to do in your next steps. And so that is about the self-work that you do more than anything. So what I wanted to do also in this, when we've been talking about um, the different areas of scribal anointing, we talked about administration, creative and instruction, what that might look like. And so I wanted to highlight something um, for you today, which is in you know the, the creative realm. And many of you, I'm sure, are in the creative realm. You can be in instru instructional realm, creative realm, and you might be asking yourself, what might that look like? And I wanna say to you that I do know that some of you probably read a scripture and in your holy imagination, you craft a poem. 
right? Or monologue. You know, we have so many people who are part of the conservatory who are who are truly gifted in those areas. And that is how they break up the fallow ground for all those people who know not who Christ is, right? There may be a poem or a song or a play or a monologue or something where God has truly inspired them in such a way that they are revealing the heart, the mind, and the will of Christ through this poem, right? Someone gets to hear it. And so I wanted to share with you some something that I wrote maybe about nine or 10 years ago. And um, it just comes from scripture. And so if you recall, um, Mary, there's so many Marys. Uh, there, this was uh, something about me that I would read and I would want to know the backstory of someone I read about. You know, you get a little blur, you get a couple of sentences and then you start asking questions of God. Well, I wonder where did they live? Well, what did they do for a living? Were they married? Uh, did they have children? Uh, who was their uncle or what did they do? And how were the times? And when they went to the market, like these are questions that I, I'm positive. I'm not the only person that asks these questions because when I'm reading these stories, this is what I want to know. I want to know because I don't think they're so different than who we are. I really don't. Um, and so this is taken from, it's known as Mary's song, Luke uh, 1, 46 to 55. And this is just the spoken word that came from that. And you can recall in that Luke 1, where she goes and she visits her cousin, Elizabeth, and then she sees it. And then, you know, there's a leaping uh, that happens inside of Elizabeth because she knows that Mary is carrying our Savior. God is with us. And so it reads, first, my thoughts scattered like petals in a pond, fragile, floating upon ripples. In time, they unite and rest in his bouquet of mercy, converging to a place of stillness. But even in the silence, I hear rejoicing, questions no longer wonder or wander. I am present, let it be so. His word leaps inside of me. This pure joy, for who am I? But one small being, bowed head, bended knees, draped in favor, for who am I? That's the question we ask ourselves. Humbly yielded to thee, for who am I? A lowly vessel, let me be a witness in awe of his strength and power. Devastate arrogant kings. See them gallop on their high horses, prideful. But his grace and mercy scoop up the poor and lonely marred deep in dark petals, pot puddles, remembering the promises to Abraham from days long ago. Outstretched arms, generation to generation, welcome his embrace, for he is our savior. So as you go through your process, and it's not a one-time thing because it is not linear, linear, we're always becoming, we're getting stronger, we're growing in our mind, our heart, and our spirit, we're doing all of these things. Allow Holy Spirit to speak to you possibly in a different way. If you journal, then possibly you may write directions. If you wrote written manuals, then possibly allow God, don't box God and put God in a container and say, I, that's not what I do. Posture yourself in humility and allow God to speak to you in different ways. So remember, we are the spiritual archeologist. And again, understanding not just our past and present, but the future, understanding our destiny and what God has to say about us and remembering that we have to believe what God says, even, even in that times when it doesn't look like it, because we're looking at our lives, we're examining our lives and we're seeing this is not matching up. Remember, we walk by faith. So sometimes I'm going to say this. Sometimes there's not a clear understanding. There's not clarity. And it's like, I need to understand this to the depths of what it is. Sometimes you got to just walk in faith, right? And through that faith and hearing that word, you begin to go from low faith to good faith to higher than good faith to great faith, right? You're being faithful in the little things. And then all of a sudden, there are larger tasks at hand. There are more challenges. And then your faith becomes so strong that you're able to move mountains. So again, keeping this in mind about the treasure and earthen vessels, you know, there's this fragility that we have, but also understanding that God causes us to be excellent. It's not the things that we do. We all have a myriad of things that we do, right? We, we 
We got all kinds of titles. <laughs> we got accomplishments and accolades. We got all these things that we do. And the world, because according to world systems, right? The world systems will say, if you have this, that means you're that. If you don't have that, that means you're this, right? If you've gone there, then you're here. If you haven't gone, gone there before, then oh, you know, woe is you. But the excellence that we have is of God, right? Remember, this is a different system. This is kingdom thinking, right? And it's not about, I was talking to someone the other day about all these things that you start studying, right? The phrase growth mindset. Growth mindset is nothing but mind of Christ, right? People start talking about neuroplasticity and all these other things. Having the mind of Christ is beyond a growth mindset, right? You can't really encapsulate that into one phrase because it's so expansive. The depth, the width, the breadth of it, it goes beyond our finite minds. But God says, I love you so, I'm going to give you access to that. So that's why that's that treasure inside of us. So let's take a look at these five tools and what I want you to do in the chat box. I want you to write down which tool, not a favorite, but one you find yourself coming back to, a one that maybe you're working on right now. Which of these tools, magnifier, trowel, hand shovel, water, notepad, which of these tools do you find yourself coming back to or maybe lingering a little longer than the other tools? And I'm going to take a look in the chat box. Yeah, I see shovel. Yeah. Yeah, magnifier. Yes, magnifier. Yeah, we can't get away from the magnifier. We cannot get away from it. Yes. Mm, very good. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is so good. So good. So what we're going to do right now is take a look at some excavation. Now, we probably, reading the Bible, you may not say that about Moses or King David or Apostle Paul. And I do have a disclaimer because I've noticed that some of the biblical case studies that I've had uh, have been men. But I want to invite you to understand that God unearths and unveils uh, women. The, the, and, and even though I do not, um, I'm going to urge you to take a look at the lives of some of those women we talked about, I think, um, Minister Darlene talked about Mary and there are multiple Marys, you know, Mary Magdalene, Mary mother or Mary and Martha, Mary of Jesus. Right. Um, so there are many, you know, there's Anna the prophet, uh, there's Miriam. There's so many women of the Bible that we know use their excavation tools and so many women who may not be talked about as much, but surely they were important because if they were not, they would not be in the Bible. So I would really provoke you to go and study that out in a very holistic manner to look at what God was doing in the lives of women. But for the purposes of this teaching, these are some men that I wanted us to take a look at. Uh, so let's take a look at Moses, right? Some of the things that Moses may have done um, as he was using his excavation tools. And I am I want to uh, say in advance that to look at and examine the lives of people in the Bible, Old Testament or New Testament, um, it's a journey within itself. And so by, by no means am I suggesting that what I have composed here together is the totality there's revelation after revelation. You'll find yourself reading a scripture and then you'll go, oh, I, oh, that's what that, oh, oh, okay. It's so expansive. The word of God is so expansive. you can be talking about one person and one scripture and you can be on that for quite a while. But when we look at the life of Moses and him using the magnifier, we can look in Exodus 33 and Moses says, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me? or with your people, unless you go with us. And that's an exodus. So remember, uh, Moses had his own little uh, journey that he had to go on. What is his trial, right? When he uh, went through, uh, you know, seeing how his people, how his brother was being treated, right? As looking, questioning things like this is not right, right? There was the mur uh, murder of an Egyptian. He went into exile when he had to run away. There's that insecurity, there's doubt, there's fear. 
not understanding that God is with him when he went to God and God says, listen, I will be with you. And then here's his water. When God says, he says to God, I, what, what shall I tell them? Right? They're not going to believe me. Like they're not going to listen to me. God says, you need to tell him that I am. Right? And also, and this is a this is a lesson within itself, and some of you may want to go back and, and do this, but establishing the council of elders, right? In that moment of time, listening to God, and that's in Numbers 11 and 25, and that's so expansive, um, listening to God, where God says, I want you to establish this council of elders, and God's spirit being upon him, and then he took, that was a truly a God care, God community. When the spirit was on Moses and God took that spirit and poured it onto the council of elders and they began to prophesy. You go back and you read this and I'm telling you it, whatever you thought, each time it becomes fresh and God continues to reveal something and his word becomes so revelatory in a, in a truly different way. And then of course, what did Moses do with all of these experiences, right? He, he established and wrote the first five books of the Bible, the Torah right? So this is how he was able to take what God gave to him. And of course, understanding the significance of the council of the 70 elders. So what I have on um, is what did God say? So if you'll notice at the very beginning, part one of this, I had this template here. Who am I? What is my purpose? What do, where do I fulfill my purpose? When will I begin to express it? And so these are some things here. So who, who was Moses? God's prophet and teacher, right? You can look at Exodus. All through Exodus, you can see there is account after account. What was his pur purpose? To be the deliverer, to deliver children of Israel from bondage in Egypt, right? Where did he fulfill it, right? Like he had to go back and, 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 and speak to, to the Pharaoh and let him know that, th that I have been appointed by God to be the deliverer for my people, right? When did he express it? So there are moments throughout. They're not one particular moment, but these are just smaller moments throughout scripture when the angel of the Lord gave him specific instructions. And even though he questioned God, and even though he said, who am I? He was obedient to it, right? How did he express it, right? Feeling not confident, insecure and saying, listen, I, I don't know. I don't have these eloquent words. Like my tongue gets tied sometimes, right? God says, listen, I got an answer for that, right? How about your brother? He can be your mouthpiece and also look at your hand. You have something in your hand. So if you just take a look at Exodus and look at what happened and how God truly showed Moses who he was, who he was destined to become, this is where you will see what happened to Moses, whether he was displaced, in place, or in place. And in this case, he was displaced because he went into exile. But even in those moments, even if you read the story about him being in exile and what happened, God could truly continue to use him, even though he was not physically there in that geographic space. He caused him to go back to that. That's the God that we serve. Like, you may not be there, but I got plans for you, and you're going to go back and do as I say do, and tell them that I am, that I am, right? That I am the one who will deliver them, right? So here's the treasure. I just love this because I'll tell you this. If you go and you start looking at scripture about the different practices or different tools or how God worked in, there's always this question about who am I? And God answers that question. No one ans answers that question. God answers that questions for them. And so this is taken from Exodus 3, 7, and 14. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppressed of my people who are in Egypt and have read their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrow. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and large place, to a, plan, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Morites and the Pezzarites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, all the ites, right? Now, therefore, behold, the city of the children of Israel have come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. 
But Moses said to God, Moses is asking the question, who am I? Who am I? Right? That I should go to Pharaoh. Like, it's like, who am I? I don't, I like, I got to have some title. I got to do this, that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. So he said, I will certainly be with you. And this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they shall, they say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus, you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. So God reveals to Moses who you are. So you don't have got in this process. God is going to reveal to you who you are, right? Will you be obedient, right? If God says that I've noticed that, that there's a group that I want you to intercede for, or there's something that's happening, right? in the land, in the space that you live in, in your city, in your state, in your group, right? There's something, I've seen affliction, I've seen suffering, right? And I'm sending you. What, how will we answer that call? What will we do? Right? So I just thought this would be, because I love, you know, maps and such. I thought that this would be a really good visual for you to see as well. Um, when Moses, uh, when he moves to Median and when he's in exile. And so you can see the travels, what happens during this time. And I think it's really important for us. We see these maps and we see, we look at geography as something in the past. I think it's really important for us to understand that God still moves in these ways. We may be in specific geographic locations, but God may call you to another space. And what makes it so great is that God has called man to create technology. He already knew about it, that even the fact that we are probably coming from different time zones in this space, united together, ministering to one another, teaching one another, uh, and supporting one another in this space. But sometimes, sometimes God will cause us to actually physically go to different spaces because we are called to those areas. So I want you guys to keep that in mind as well. All right, let's take a look at David. So David, and when it comes to magnifier, you know, you, you know, when you're a psalmist and you're a harpsist, it's, it's all about glorifying, magnifying, and worshiping God. So in Psalms 34, 1, David says, I will bless the Lord at all the times. His praises shall continually be in my mouth. So we can conclude from this that King David was perpetually in a space of magnifying God. It's, it's, he abided in that, right? He says, I come against you in the name of the Lord. And remember, even before um, he was called to serve Saul, King Saul, that even as a young man in the battle against this giant that everybody was fearful was, God, that David was continuing, even in that moment, as, as a teen, he continued to magnify. He said, I come in the name of the Lord, right? He's a teen saying this. What is his trial, right? So we know that some things went awry. This lust for Bathsheba orchestrating the death of her husband, Uriah, the death of his son. These are all challenging moments and obstacles in his life when he just, you know, had to be convicted by prophet Nathan, right? And then we have the shovel. You have the kind of unearthing, this, this cave of Abdullam. When, of course, his family members came there, he was on the run escaping King Saul. But in that cave, in that cave, they came and converged. 400 men. Can you imagine that? 400 men and family. They came and they had their issues and their problems. And that's found in 1 Samuel 22. If you want to go back and kind of rekindle yourself with, with what was going on. And then, of course, you have Psalms 1 and 3. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth his fruit in his season. And it's most certainly David did. If you look at his life and the span of his life and what he was able to do. And then of course, King David is responsible for the Psalms. Some say 73, some says oh 70, over 70. But we do know that he's responsible for these Psalms that we sing, 
that we uh, use our holy imagination to write verse from them, to write prose, but in all things um, that they are God-breathed texts that we use to heal us, to inspire us, to encourage us, to understand what it means to have a deeper relationship with God. And King David is responsible for that because of all these things that he went through, he was able to collect all of this, but it was also predetermined when he was a young person who he would soon be. So there were challenges, there was some shovels, there was some trials going around, there was a lot of excavation to the point that we now have a record and a chronicle of what happened to David during the and we all get to benefit from that. So let's take a look at this. So who's King David, right? He's been called a man after God's own heart. He's a king, uh, a psalmist, a worshiper. Um, and in Acts 13, 22, it reads, and when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart who will do all my will, right? Can you imagine someone who says a man after my heart, God speaking about him? So what is his purpose? He's a leader um, and shepherd of God's people. Where does he fulfill it, right? There's the kingdom of Israel that comes together and when will I begin to express this? The origins, of course, can be, we can go back to the scripture that talks about even during this time, you know, he was just a lowly shepherd boy, but he was always being prepared. He was ready in that moment, right? So we we didn't, the scripture doesn't say that David went back and he thought on, he thought on some things and he had a little fear that first, I'm not going to do this. This does not make sense. Let me go back and practice a little bit. He had been prepared for such a time as that. How does he uh, re uh, express it? Excuse me. He's always mad, mad, uh, mighty in battle. He's a worshiper. He's a general, right? These are things that we can say that the scripture tells us, the scripture tells us about the life of King David. And then the treasure, here's what we do know. And again, isn't this it's interesting? It's fascinating to me. As a scripture, God tells you who you are. We have this account of, of men and women in the Bible. It says all the tribes, and this is 2 Samuel 5 and 2, all the tribes of Israel came to De David at Hebron. We are your own flesh and blood, they said. Even in the past when Saul ruled us, you were the one who led Israel in battle. The Lord has said to you, the Lord has said to you, you will be shepherd of my people, Israel, the leader of Israel, right? All the leaders of Israel had come to Hebron. King David made an agreement with them at Hebron in front of the Lord. So they anointed David king of Israel. David was 30 years old when he became king and he ruled for 40 years. In Hebron, he ruled Judah for seven years and six months. In Jerusalem, he ruled for 33 years over all Israel and Judah. Now, I don't know about you all. I always think it's fascinating too when I, I read about the collecting of numbers, that someone has recorded the numbers down to the day, sometimes the hour, the year. Truly scribes of the Lord who know not who think, but who they knew at the time that this information is important. So we can examine the life and the treasure they revealed that God shows him that he's been doing this all along, that you are the leader of the kingdom of Israel. And so I want you to um, take a look at this map, another map here. You can see the kingdom, um, the way it looks. So sometimes we may think a little small area, we may not know um, how significant that was during that time to be the king of a, this kingdom of Israel at the time. And so that is the life of King David. Let's take a look at Apostle Paul. And I think we hear a lot about Apostle Paul because we're reading a lot about in New Testament. Apostle Paul was something else. Let's just say that he was something else. I think we can all agree um, that he was something else. So we all know that 
and and the epistles are largely written by Apostle Paul. One thing that we can note about epistles that they're letters, and it's a little different than traditional letters that we have. Usually, when we um, write a letter, the signature is at the bottom. Things is different about Apostle Paul at the very beginning. He tells you who he is and who he comes in the name of the Lord. Right? That he at the very at the onset of the letter he identifies who he is and in the name of who he comes. Right? And and he's also thankful. So the salutation at the very beginning also has the signature of who this is and the fact that if you look at on the origins of this epistle, it's about sending news. So we know that throughout the epistles that Paul was sending this news about what was happening, right? So what was Paul doing prior to his conversion, prior to this experience that he had with Jesus? He was persecuting Jew, uh, persecuting Christians at the time, right? We also know that the shovel on this road to Damascus, right? We all sometimes people have used that as a phrase um, in popular uh, jargon. You know, sometimes people will use it in their conversation. You know, I had a road to Damascus experience, right? And I, I know what they mean, but truly, it wasn't quite what Apostle Paul experienced, right? We can be clear about that. Um, so the water, after meeting Ananias, he is strengthened um, at this time. Remember, he had to get physically strong. He strengthened with God care and in God community, right? So God is speaking to that, like, there's going to be this person coming and, and his reputation preceded him. Folks knew about Saul. They knew what he was about, right? And it didn't, like, imagine someone tells you there's someone who's going to be coming to you if you hearken and listen to God. And you knew their reputation preceded them. And it wasn't a very good reputation. How should How would you respond to that, right? It says also in Acts 9 that, that Paul was was baptized and he was filled with the Holy Spirit. So what's his notepad? That we get to read the epistles. We get to read Galatians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians. We get to read Romans. We get to read Philippians, Thessalonians, Philemon. We get to read all of this, right? Because Paul was capturing this experience on his journey when he was out doing mission trips, when he was having conversations. And the fact that he... <laughs> It's really, God is something else the more you think about it. Here you have this person who was persecuting uh, Christians and now you've been commissioned to go forth that God sends you to minister to them in such a way. So I want you to take a look, not a map this time. Um, let me take a look at this excavation, but at the end, I want you to take a look at the mission trip. So who was Apostle Paul? Apostle, he was sent, teacher of the gospel, the epistles, um, what's his purpose? To preach and teach the gospel of the kingdom to Gentiles mainly, right? Um, where do I fulfill my purpose? These are different areas that he went. You know, Ephesus, he's been Antioch. These are so many. And remember I said earlier that God is so merciful and gracious to us. We get to convene and come, con come together using this, you know, virtual devices because the world is ever evolving, but there may be times when God wants you to physically go to those spaces where those people live. And it may not be in your hometown. So will you be obedient to that if God sends you forth? And not only be obedient, will you be prepared to do what God tells you to do? So when will I begin to express? Well, it says after um, encounter, um, there was an encounter on the road to Damascus. Again, that's in Acts 9, right? So prior to this, we know what Paul, what Saul was doing. And then after that, there's this convergence. Can you imagine? You go blind, right? Uh, you can't see anything. And, and Jesus is saying, why, why are you doing this, right? So we read about these things. But remember, all scripture is given this inspiration. It's God breathed upon. It is eternal truth. And then how, do you, how did Apostle Paul express that? There is speaking. There's preaching. There's teaching. There's provoking. There's correction, right? And he does this by way of mission trips. And what's also important to understand in this excavation process that there was a singular focus, that there was such clarity that even when there were times when someone did not agree with Paul, because he was so deeply rooted in his mission and his assignment, that he didn't allow um, someone's uh, 
propensity to be contentious lure, lure him away from his what he had to do. Like I, he is so laser focused on what he had to do that he kept it moving, right? Um, because it was it was his time, and he knew he had been appointed um, to move forward to preach the gospel, to tell others that all this other stuff that you've been has been diluted and polluted. Um, it is a counterfeit, and what I bring you is the truth of an eternal God. So here's what it says about the treasure. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. This is so important, right? We have these doctrines. We have people that are coming up with doctrines, like because it feels good to me and it looks good and it looks like a good deed, right? Sometimes those things are preached of men, but Paul makes it clear. He says, listen, it's not, it's preached by me. It's not, a, it's not according to man. This is not this is not stuff that man made up. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. My God. Listen, I didn't sit down at the foot of a man who says, I need you to do that. It was taught through the revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. You talk about some excavation some stuff that he probably had to grapple with, but had been free and healed of that by Holy Spirit and teaching revelation of Jesus Christ. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries, uh, contemporaries in my own nation. So here I persecuted Christians. Where I was a learned man, a learned man, right? I exceeded those who my contemporaries being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my father's. He was, he was zealous, all right, right, persecuting uh, folks. Uh, but when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles, you've been murdering folk. And on that road, you talk about a conversion. The Lord says, listen, no more. You will not even be the same person. And I'm sending you to preach to the Gentiles. I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went to Arabia and returned again to Dam Dam Damascus. So you can see in this section how God revealed to Paul what he would do, how this was the revelation of Jesus Christ was so clear to him. And then you can see that the ministry began to expand as he preached the gospel, the good news of the kingdom of God. And so I want you to take a look at this missionary journey. It's very expansive. So here we have roughly, and again, just the documentation of years and what happens during this time. Um, the conversion on that road, that's AD 37. So look at the time from 37 to AD 40, right? You're, you're looking at three years, preachers and ministers in Tarsus and surrounding regions. So you, it's not a long period of time. There was like an urgency, like, listen, this conversion is going to happen. And then there's an, there's an urgency. You know, I, there, there are so many days, right? Your eyes are going to be open. You're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm going to have those in a God care, God community who are going to be supporting you because I've sent you there. And then you're going to get yourself together. And guess what? You're going to go out and preach and minister, right? And then in 44 and 45, you see he relocates to Antioch in Syria. So you can look at this, that first mission, uh, first missionary journey with Barnabas happened that lasted for like two years. And then you can see the second missionary journey, right? So this is how we see these, these uh, you know, the first Corinthians or the second Corinthians. This is about his trips, his missionary trips that he had approximately how many times, how much time he spent in these areas. Third missionary journey, right? Um, lasts approximately four years, right? So you can see from AD 37 all the way down 
to AD 67, just to kind of look at this, um, this guy, this, this record of what happened, this timeline, so to speak, of Paul's missionary journey, how very important it was for him to get out there after this conversion, to be able to speak and minister the word of God with an urgency and to do it um, consistently and not be deterred, but be so deeply rooted and convinced that this is what he was called to do. Um, it's just a wonderful thing to read about. And it's still so much for us. We get to not only glean it, but we get to understand um, more and more as we go through our self-excavation process, what God is calling us to do and what it will take, what, it, what God is desiring from, from us, right? And, and he's desiring movement and momentum, the two M's, movement and momentum, right? Uh, not steady and stagnation, right? Not uh, apathy, right? But he's requiring us to move as he speaks. He's requiring us to move even in times when we don't fully understand exactly everything, but we get glimpses and pieces of things that we should do and we act on it. We move on it. We're obedient to it. And then God opens up a new revelation to us. And then we're building because we're on a trajectory and there's momentum in that. So I'm going to end this now because I know there may be some questions. What I wanted to be very clear is that we have these tools. Tools are always good and tools are for us to use. But the result of using tools is to clearly unearth who God says you are. And unearthing your identity means there's something on your part that you must do. There's something that God is calling you to do. It's not unearthing for you to tell someone, well, I was sitting on my couch and God said, I'm this, right? That we're not just listening, but we're being obedient to the word of God. And we're demonstrating that we're executing something that he has given us. And it looks different for different people. And that's what's so wonderful about the word of God. We are all very different. He's called us to different things for the because we are all in the kingdom and we complement one another. That's the beauty of being in the kingdom of God, that he uses us um, and that we are pursuing the purpose that he gives us, that the pursuits that we have in our lives are no longer pursuing what the world says we should do to be a valuable person. We're pursuing what God says we should pursue because our identity is a spiritual identity. It is internal to identity. It's not according to the statutes or the goals or the timelines or the standards of world systems, right? That we are a part of something that, that was, is, and yet to come. That we are part of the kingdom of God. And so I'm going to pause right now. Um, but I want to say clearly, thank you so very much for those who have been joining the Scribal Conservatory. And there's so much more that is coming forth. Um, I pray that in when you have your Bible and your notepad and when you're writing notes or when you're listening, that there's something that's turning inside of you that's saying that, you know, maybe I was in this space and time of my life, but I have to be quickened and I have to create a consistency and a momentum that keeps me moving forth, that I cannot be in a posture of complacency, that God is calling me higher to do something because if it's him that's doing the revealing, you better believe there's some doing in the revealing, not just a sitting, but a doing. The revealing is a doing, all right? So again, thank you all so much. And I'm going to stop my screen right now. So Father God, we just thank you for everyone who came in today, everyone who decided that they wanted to continue on this journey of excavating the you The, the you that's in them, that they are not excavating themselves so that they can self-title, they can give themselves a title. But there is someone inside of them. There is someone that you are excavating, that you are revealing to them, that is so much more than what they thought. It's so much more than what they could have ever experienced before. And so we thank you that your word is true. 
We thank you for your scriptures, which are God breathed upon. We thank you that they are using their tools by magnifying you consistently, not just when they feel like it, but understanding that what they magnify, they will continue to dispense. They will continue to live and abide and be in a place, habitat, habit, a habitation, a place of just residing uh, and, and magnifying you. We, we're thankful, Lord, for the questions. We're thankful for the provoking. We're thank you for the challengings. We're thank you for we're thanking you for all those things that we thought that we had to stay in that lowly place. We don't no longer have to be in that place. We don't have to be in that place of self pity. We don't have to be in that place of thinking that this is only our portion. That you have called us to something greater. And if we walk by faith and not by what we see, then it is ours. So, Father, we thank you for everyone who has an ear to hear, that they listen and hearken, that they understand that who you are is so much greater than what they have placed. They've placed you in these containers and what you're, they think their problems are larger than you. But you have told us that you are here to set us free from mindsets and from ideas about how we should function in this world. So we thank you, Father, and we love you and we honor you because we embrace who we are as kingdom citizens. We honor you, God, and we love you. And we just give you the highest praise in Jesus' name, amen.